Hello, everybody. It is wonderful to be there. Uh, here, I wish I was there. But um, thanks for joining me for 20 minutes of Constor Index Compression Nerditude. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, this is all about storing analytic data in SQL Server and storing it, storing it efficiently. I have all the distractions in the world in front of me here. I have my session, SQL, the video of all of you out there. Hi. Hi. And then the chat. So uh, I will answer questions at the end in the chat because 20 minutes isn't enough time to really interact. Um, but I'll stay on for a while in case anybody has anything. And with that, I'd love to just dive right in. Dive right in. This is me, um, Edward Pollack. I am a data platform MVP. And I organize lots and lots of events, and I'm involved in lots of writing and speaking and stuff. If you happen to be in New York City, I don't know, May 6th or so, feel free to stop by SQL Saturday there. If not, you can wave from afar, and uh, that is cool too. Feel free if you have any questions to go unanswered today for any reason to find me afterwards on Twitter. I'll have some more information of mine at the end. Uh, feel free to contact me. That is wonderful. And off we go. Basically, the goal here is to briefly review column store indexes and what they're all about, how they store their data, and then dive into some of the nitty gritty of compression. How does it work? Why does it work? Why is it important? And then we're also going to demo some of the views that are available that give you some insight into compression in column store indexes because Microsoft exposes all that information to us. Therefore, we can look at it, use it, and make sense of it, which helps us optimize further. Great. Here are the basics on how column store indexes are stored. These are indexes built for analytic data, specifically data warehousing data is optimal for it, um, but really any sort of analytic data we are summing and minning and maxing lots and lots and lots of rows across a few columns is great. And the way that happens is in the column store indexes, unlike row store where you have you know, values for each column being stored sequentially-ish, um, here it's all done by columns. So data is broken up into row groups. A row group is up to two to the 20th rows, about a million. We'll just say for argument's sake, it's more, but it's a million. <clears throat> and then each column is separately stored within that, that row group in what's called a segment. Each segment is a row group's worth of rows and one column of data, and that's it. And each segment gets compressed separately, and that compression is unique for each segment. So they can all be compressed the same or different depending on data types and values and all that good stuff. And so when you process data in a column store index, it is processed by segment. You don't read the whole thing. You don't read all the data for one column or one row group. You read the segments you need, which is why they can be very, very efficient. And this, again, this is ideal for data warehouse style data or data that's very repetitive and not too wide. Basics of compression, every column is compressed separately. This is really valuable. And it's worth mentioning again because it typically, especially data warehousing style data, <clears throat> the values within a single column will repeat a lot. They'll repeat a lot or they'll have similarities that allow them to compress well. For example, if you have sequential values from one to 100, um, those actually can compress well because they're all numbers in a short range. You don't have to store it in like an int or a big int or something crazy like that. Values often repeat a lot, like some lookup value that goes to a table of 20 values. It's gonna repeat a lot when you have a million of them. And so the more it repeats, the better it compresses. Things that are most often compressed best are like monies and dates and numbers. Uh, keys, like lookups, compress wonderfully. You, know, you can very easily get 10, 20, 30 to 1 compression or better only because so much repetition occurs. And I've demoed scenarios where you get 100 to 1 or more, which is just off the walls amazing. <clears throat> and you really can view this as the opposite of traditional row store uh, tables, just the classic Clustered index, non clustered index, this is the opposite of that in terms of how it functions and what it is most optimal for. So I'm going to dive right into compression. I'm going to roughly break up compression of columns or indexes into really three steps. The first step is encoding. The goal of encoding is to take data and change how it is presented to reduce the amount of storage needed. This is lossless. We don't in any way remove data or make it hard to get. It's simply rearranging how it's stored and adjusting it to make it take up less space. In columns or indexes in SQL Server, um, the common encoding methods used are dictionary encoding and value encoding. And we're going to demo and explain how all this stuff works over the course of the next 16 minutes, because we can do that. <clears throat> Again, lossless algorithms and the beauty of this encoding is that they're very, they require very little footprint to use. So the CPU, memory, um, the resources needed to do this are very low. And so compressing and decompressing, while not cheap, is not expensive and is certainly a saver in the long run in terms of resources. We have lots of dynamic management views, 
that tell us what's going on here. And I'll show a few of them later on. Uh, I'll share the queries afterwards so everyone has them. Um, but the two here that are worth mentioning are the column store segments and column store dictionaries. And those provide information on the segments, what they look like, how they're compressed. And then if it uses dictionary coding, what do the dictionaries look like? How big are they? How small are they? What's in them? How many distinct values? And so on and so forth. So you really get a nice peek at how the compression works. You don't quite get that as well with like classic page or row compression. It's not quite as transparent to the user. For example, <clears throat> here's how dictionary encoding might look. I have a small yummy table here full of some desserts. They're good. And I have represented them as Varkar. So on the right side, I say, hey, here's how many bytes there are. A byte is a character. That's all. And so I have a bunch of values, and they add up to 203 bytes. Awesome. And many repeat, of course. If you're at a bakery and you sell baked goods, you're going to repeat a lot because you have some things that everyone loves and orders a lot, and some things that may order a little less often. But certain things will repeat often. So <clears throat> first step is take that and create a dictionary lookup table. Uh, it's a dictionary, and essentially it's going to have an index ID. It's going to have one value for each one on the left, so one instance of each distinct value in the table, in this case, in the segment, or in the column store index. And then I include the size as a reference here. So the dictionary here is about 82 bytes. And the original data is 203 bytes. So we can see we're getting somewhere here. We have a nice little lookup hash table here. Next, I take the data in that uh, segment, and I map it over to the dictionary. So instead of storing the same big strings over and over and over, we now say, OK, Let's store the index ID, which, by the way, only goes from 0 to 4. So that's a very, very small int. It's like smaller than a small int, smaller than a tiny int. How many bits does it take? Very, very few. That's the beauty of this. <clears throat> so now we encode the data, and we say, all right, here are all the index IDs, and here's how big they are. It's three bits is all you need to show a value from 0 to 4. So now our total size of the lookup table is 82 bytes. And the total size of our encoded data is just 33 bits. It's absolutely tiny. And so we can see here that we turned 203 bytes into like 86 bytes, 86.125 or whatever, all technical. And the bigger your table gets, the bigger the savings are. You can multiply this by 100, 1,000, 10,000 to show what the effect would be in a larger segment, because it can go up to 2 to the 20th rows, about a million values. All right, that's an example of dictionary compression. And there are other kinds of compression out there as well, such as value encoding, uh, dictionary encoding, value encoding. I'm going to show how some of that looks on a demo shortly. So you encode all of your data, you rearrange it, you make it look perfect and beautiful just the way you want it. And value encoding is just basically mathematics. You apply math to make your values smaller. The next step is one that is not really discussed very often or understood very well, but is very valuable as well, is that we now have these values back here that repeat over and over and over, um, but they're all out of order, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 4, 2, 0, 0, and so on. Um, but it's hard to compress that because the number of repeated values in a row don't really repeat much. They're not ordered. <clears throat> now, the key to SQL Server is that within a segment in a column store index, the order of the data doesn't matter. It really doesn't make a difference. You can reorder the data, and the end results are the same. A column store index does not guarantee order, even with the order clause in SQL 2022. There's no guaranteed order, and that's important. If order doesn't matter, you can rearrange the rows and do whatever you want. So the contents of a segment don't change. You can reorder it however you want, and the sums, the mins, the maxes, and all that will stay the same. So this is called optimization, where you take the row order within each segment, uh, sorry, within each row group, actually, um, and you rearrange it. It'll apply to all the segments in the row group. And SQL Server will do this using an algorithm that basically determines what's the most optimal way to reorder the data to get it to compress most effectively. In SQL Server, we call this Vertipack optimization, and it is exposed in views. Um, that will be demoed shortly. Uh, this is an expensive operation, though. It's something you can't do over and over. You can't recompute it all the time. So typically, when you build your column store index, this will happen once, and then it won't get rearranged unless you do a rebuild. That's just how this works. It's too expensive. You can't do it over and over and over. But because you now rearrange it in order based on values, you can compress it a lot better. So instead of having 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 4, 2, 0, 0, we order it up nicely like this. So here are our values from before. Notice that this doesn't save any space. It's 33 bits on the left and 33 bits on the right. But we've reordered it by index ID. So now. Everything's in order. <clears throat> and we can see we have three zeros, a one, three twos, a two, a three, a four, four twos, a three, and two fours. Great. Everything's ordered now. And you can imagine on a larger amount of values, 
this will be very convenient for compression because now we can very easily compress using repeated values. It's very easy to say I have three zeros or 10 ones or 52s. That compresses beautifully. That's optimization. The last step in column store compression is the actual compression itself. This is what we think of when we think of compression, is you take the data, and for column store, it uses the Microsoft X Velocity algorithm. Express is used for archive compression. Archive compression is um, compression that's more effective, but requires more resources to do, so it's better for like cool, cold, warmish data, not data you're hitting constantly. <clears throat> Primary goal of compression at this stage is to focus on repeating byte patterns group them together, aggregate them, um, and then shrink them down and compress them. This is what you think of when you think of compression. I have the same bytes in a row 10 times in a row. I can shrink that down to a reference to that same byte being repeated 10 times or n times or whatever. And the VertiPack optimization makes this much, much more efficient. So we have encoding, we have optimization, and we have compression. Uh, one example for a common compression algorithm is run length compression. This is essentially where you take now your repeated values you squish them down with indexes. And you can say, hey, I have three zeros. That's the value zero three times. I have a one. I have four twos. That's two, four times. I have a three, and then I have two fours. And so now you can see that the amount of data we have and the way it's sized and shaped is shrinking, 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 shrinking. The more optimized your data is, the smaller this gets here. And so we're down to just taking index ID groups, and that's it. So for a larger table, the savings become bigger and bigger and bigger. <clears throat> Here's another example of a different kind of compression. It's called bit array compression. Um, this is great when you have values that are not sorted as much. So um, run length is great for sorted. You can just group it down into nothing. This is great for non-sorted values, where values repeat frequently, um, but they don't repeat in a row. <clears throat> so you take your original data, and you make a hash table for it, and you plop in ones wherever the value exists. And so you end up with a, a row per value, and an index, but because of the way it's done, the actual text is only stored once, and you have a bitmap full of zeros and ones. And while this isn't quite as efficient as what I demoed a second ago, the zeros and ones are cheap to store. So this is not very expensive, it doesn't cost a whole lot, and it's really great for uh, values that are not stored. And the SQL Server will choose the right things to do here. It will look at your data, inspect it, and figure out what's the best way to handle it. Is the values repeat a lot or not repeat a lot? Are they ordered or not ordered? And so on and so forth. So what can we do here to optimize? Uh, Vertipack optimization is one of the key elements here because it allows values to be grouped together and compressed nicely. But you can't do it everywhere. Uh, sometimes because it's expensive, SQL Server will opt to not use it because it's too expensive. For example, if you have a clustered column of store index with non-clustered row store indexes on it, and you insert data into that column of store index, the newly inserted data will not be optimized. Uh, it can't be because the ability to map that non-clustered back to the clustered is too expensive. You could do it. It will be expensive, it will be slow, and it will be painful on your server, so that isn't done intentionally. You can work around this. <clears throat> Either drop the non-clusters, insert your data, or simply do rebuilds occasionally to get VertiPack optimization applied. Similarly, memory-optimized column store indexes are also not optimized. Memory structures are very different than those on storage. Uh, traditional storage, and therefore, uh, before doing any memory optimized column store, verify with certainty that you're actually saving resources and that it's faster, because it may or may not be. Um, the idea of like real time analytics is beautiful, um, but sometimes memory optimized column store isn't any better than traditional column store on fast storage. Depending on what your situation with hardware is like, you may find one better than the other. <clears throat> Lastly, another important limitation here dictionaries are limited to 16 megabytes. Row groups will get split if you hit that limit. So if you have very, very long strings in your data and you hit that 16 megabyte limit for whatever reason, then your row group will get split immediately because you can't have infinite number of dictionaries applied to one row group. At most, you can have one global, one local, and if you hit the limit, it will split it up. You want the 1 million rows, the 2 to the 20th per row group. If you don't, then you may end up getting it broken down like this due to dictionary um, issues. And this stuff is exposed in views. You can see it. <clears throat> and you can understand if this is happening to you. And it's not very common. 16 megs sounds small, um, but in the column store world, it isn't that small, and things are compressed really nicely. Uh, if you do run into this problem, it's usually due to big, big, big strings. If you have giant strings in a column store index, instead of normalizing them away, 
shrinking them down or finding a way to make them more efficiently stored. Uh, similar, similarly, if you have very, very repetitive columns, you don't want to normalize them. This is really just a way to get rid of things that make dictionaries too big. So just keep in mind, there's a size limit, and if you hit it, you might run into problems. Demos are beautiful. We all love live demos. Correct, correct, all right. Let's dive right on in and look at some of our metadata. Dictionaries are exposed directly right here, sys.com store dictionaries. Simple view, you can go in and just see basically what each dictionary looks like in its storage and how it's stored. This provides not a lot of useful information yet, but you know they exist and you know some of the key things here are the entry counts and the size. We can join this to everything else to get a better idea. Feel free, I'll post this code later. Feel free to steal it, it's all yours. Um, I go ahead and I join a whole bunch of different views here together, the dictionaries with partitions, objects, columns, all the usual suspects of SQL Server views, uh, types. I just do it for one table. <clears throat> if I go ahead and run and look at this, you'll see, oh, I can see now for the table, each column and each partition, and keep in mind that uh, across partitions, you'll essentially get what's basically a distinct column store structure in each partition. Obviously, you query it, you get data from all the partitions, but each one will have its own row groups and its own segments separate from the ones in other partitions. So you can see here, for example, you know, city key is this many bytes, this many entries, and so on and so forth. None of these are approaching 16 megs, none are even close, but it's worth checking and seeing. If you're running into issues where you find your row groups are really tiny, you can check here and just verify, hey, are they getting broken up? Are they too big? If not, great. <clears throat> and I have a lot of additional metadata here just for convenience. Similarly, <clears throat> I can flatten it out in the other direction and take each column and look at the segment metadata for each one. So I'm grabbing column store segments, plus a join into pretty much everything else we've talked about so far, all the object metadata, column types, dictionaries. You can have a primary and a secondary dictionary on a given row group. Typically, you'll see a primary. You will not see a secondary very often, a local dictionary. Um, they'll appear occasionally. Um, you, can, you can only have one of each. For a row group, you can't have more than one. That's life. <clears throat> so we can look here and we can see, you know, for each partition for this one table and this one column built to customer key, we can see length, precision, scale, and some information. Is there a global dictionary? How many entries are in it? How big is it? What's the row count for each one of these row groups in each partition? And then this is more inf information here that's very useful and very interesting. The base and the magnitude, the min and the max ID. This tells you if value encoding occurred and how it worked. Value encoding is math, and it allows a column to be shrunken down further. It has a base, and it has an exponent. That information is provided here if you're interested in seeing how it works. <clears throat> you can also check and see what's got inverted pack optimization. I can go in and look at tables, columns or indexes, and find out which ones have it and which ones don't. And I can see here everything has it except for three. Here, this one columns or index is missing optimization. Depending on how big it is, you may or may not care, but it could be worth if it's large enough looking into what's going on. Should I give it a periodic rebuild just to clean that up and fix it? We'll probably improve the size in bytes, that's for sure. You can see up here, other parts of it are much smaller. These are very large. That will have an impact. You can also get some detail and value encoded columns. Here's some more information. You can see for each one that's value based the base and the magnitude, and how math was done to make it happen. And a lot of these are just you know, sequential keys. But again, very useful data for research. I will share all this later, so you can dive in, look at it more closely, and play. <clears throat> so with two minutes left, I'd love to wrap up. Um, this is a very fast breeze through how column store compression works, why it works, and a few tips or tricks that can help you ensure optimization happens or your dictionaries don't overflow and break things. The compression in columns for index is amazing. You can get absolutely amazing compression rates, especially for data warehouse style data. It's compressed on storage. It stays compressed in memory until you need it. Therefore, you're saving space everywhere, backups, memory, storage, everywhere. And by using some of the information provided here, uh, you can tweak that performance and make it even better. Ensure optimization occurs, ensure dictionaries aren't too big, and to normalize when normalization makes sense. And all these DMVs provide you the transparency into that data to get what you need out of it. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat afterwards or find me later. I'd be happy to chat, answer questions, and talk it up. But we are now out of time. I'm going to leave this here. Uh, please leave feedback. Feedback is wonderful. I love to hear from you on the session, the topic, me. Um, say nice things when you can. 
but be constructive as well. Feedback is valuable to SQL bits as well. Feel free to contact me, Twitter, email, or anything else. And with that, my time is coming to a close here at SQL Bits, but thank you very much for having me today, and I hope you have a wonderful time for the rest of this event.